Hey, welcome to this episode of the podcast. My name is Paul Burgess, and I'm here today with Linda Elskud from the LDN Research Trust. And LDN stands for something which she's going to tell us about in a minute. Um, but this is going to be a real kind of specific type of um, show today because it's discussing a treatment that is really not really well known but it's massively beneficial to the right people. Um, and so stick with it, because if you've never heard of LDN, um, which Linda's going to explain in a minute, then uh, it's going to be of interest. So Linda, welcome to the show. Thank you very much for having invited me, Paul. It's, uh, it's, it's going to be welcome. amazing. <laughs> and, and, I, and I noticed you've just put your, your, um, your screen on, and so your face is all lit up. So if people are watching, we can see you better now. Um, oh, right. So tell okay. us. LDN, your story, the whole kind of thing, because I know it's, it's very interesting, but quite detailed. Okay, so LDN stands for low dose naltrexone. Now, how did I find LDN? Um, I didn't know that I had had multiple sclerosis for a very long time. I started to get pins and needles down my arms to the fingertips when I moved my head went to the doctors and I'd got a slip disc in my neck. And my husband, when he worked, he was away. So I was the caregiver for our two children and he wanted me to have a neck brace. We live in the country. So reversing and everything in a neck brace wasn't gonna happen. So I said, I didn't want one, but it, it went. But looking back, when I first knew my husband, when I was 18, he said that I was always ill, which, I took as an offence that he thought I was a hypochondriac, but he said, no, 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 you always had something wrong with you. But things would happen and they would go. So I didn't ever bother going to the doctors. But if you go further back, when I was 13, I had glandular fever. I was very, very ill. I nearly died. I had a year off school and chronic fatigue was a really big issue. So I think I'd, I'd had it for an awfully long time. So... I was working, I was studying, I was looking after my children, I was doing the, the housework, the gardening, the washing, the ironing. I was superwoman, bring it on, I could do everything. And I'd got home from work, um, it was just before Christmas 1999, and it was my dad on the phone, and I got a friend round who was going to cut my hair, she was a, a hairdresser, so I was trying to take my coat off. She was saying, hurry up, because uh, I'd been held up in traffic um, and it was snowing as well. And, my, and then there was my dad on the phone. Now, my dad didn't use the phone because he was hard of hearing. Uh, it was always my mum. So he said to me, your mum's had a heart attack and they're now taking her in the ambulance and they won't let me go with her. The reason they wouldn't let him go because he was in a wheelchair, he'd got arthritis in both knees and hips and he couldn't stand. So I said, tell them to take you. I'm on my way. I will come to the hospital. Now, it was um, usually about an hour and a quarter's ride to the hospital, but it took me about two, I think, because the roads were so bad. You know, it was rush hour and it'd been snowing and everything. And I'm an only child. So I met my dad at the hospital and my husband came and they wouldn't let my dad stay the night. So my husband took my dad home. So I stayed with my mum and she was obviously in intensive care. I thought if I went to sleep, she would go to sleep <laughs> and die. So I've got to keep awake to keep her alive. I know it sounds crazy. But that didn't really do me a lot of favours, not having slept and the trauma and the stress and everything. And I really didn't feel well and fatigue was a really big issue. And work were, um, I worked for Virgin One Account, which was online banking. And I was getting phone calls every day. When are you coming back to work? When are you coming back to work? Um, Mum got out of hospital. I'd got to look after her. She came here. My dad came here and somebody had got to look after them. And a friend of ours was a nurse and she said, go back to work. I'll come and look after your mum and dad. So that was really 
helpful. And I was just so tired. And I thought, whatever's wrong with me, I, I can't work five days a week. It's killing me. I'd get up, I'd go to work, come home and just lie down. It, it took all of my energy to do that. So I said to them at work, I don't know what's wrong with me, but I'm just feeling so ill. And there is, but I couldn't put my finger on why I felt so ill. I really can't work full time anymore. I really can't do it. So they said, okay, you can go part time and work four days a week. Well, that didn't make any difference. It was just the same. And then I had, I'd had so many different things and I had flu and I had an abscess in my tooth and my leg went numb and all these, all of these things were hitting me. And I said to my husband, it was coming towards Easter. I'm just feeling so ill. I'm in this cycle of being ill. So I'd like to go away at Easter, leave ev everything at home behind all this illness, go away, have a good time and come back and I'll feel okay. Now, wouldn't that have been great, you know? <laughs> but it seemed like a plan because I didn't know what else to do. And he couldn't go away. He was working and my eldest daughter had left home by this time. So my youngest daughter and I went and we went to Portugal. And normally it's hot at Easter. It wasn't. It was cold, wet and windy and they drained all the system. So there was, you'd go out in the rain and it was cold in the apartment. So we just had loads and loads of bedding on us. And I said to my husband, it's really odd. I said, the wind and the rain is hitting the left hand side of my face and it's gone numb. Isn't that funny that the rain can do, can do that? Talk about being naive. I said, I think I'll have to go and see the doctor when I get home. So I came home and the doctor was, mm, I think you ought to see a neurologist. Now, this was April, I believe, and I couldn't get to see the neurologist until August. So by that time, everything, all these symptoms were coming. And then I got double vision. So it was like, oh, I can't see. Everything had gone completely double. So I bought a patch to put over my eye. And that was okay. I could do one eye and then the other eye and I could see. So I carried on working, not giving into it because it's going to get better, remember. And then I got into work one day and even with the patch over my eye, I said, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to go home. I really can't do this. And I can remember coming in the door, taking my things off. Oh, I'd had a message from my daughter. She'd left her PE kit or something. And I had to drive. I really wasn't in a good position to drive. And I took her things. And I came home, took my clothes off and got in bed. And I thought, now I can focus on me. You do know what I mean? I, I've got to sort something out here. And in between that April when I stopped work and going to the hospital <clears throat> day by day, the numbness and the pins and needles got worse and you could draw a line straight down the left-hand side of my body. All of that side slowly was numb with pins and needles, but it was painful. So any clothes or bedding that touched my left-hand side really hurt. It was, it was so painful. I had twitching muscles, restless legs. My legs would thrash about so badly that all the hair on my legs had gone because it, it had rubbed off on the bedding. I lost my bowel and bladder control. I was speaking as though I'd had a stroke. I was slurring my words. I was choking on my food. I didn't know where my mouth was. I had to have somebody help me. I couldn't stand um, the left side. It was all my left side. I would try and stand and my legs would be like elastic bands and I'd bob up and down till I fell over. And then the leg strength used to go on the left leg. So then I would tip over. I had vertigo. So that, that progressed really quickly from yep. kind of April to August. I mean, that yep. kind of went from, um, I've got a few niggles to actually, I can't punch. Yeah. Yep. I see it as hitting a brick wall. You know, everything stopped. It was smash. Um, and we were talking before about having quality of life. You were saying about, you know, throwing 24 hours in the bin. But I, I'd lost my bowel and bladder control as well, which was awful. 
and my bowels were like a sneeze. I'd feel it coming on, you know, how you go, a chew. Well, it was like that, but from, from your bowels, no control whatsoever. And I was lying in bed and, the, and I had a lot of pain, a lot of pain. Um, and it used to move around. And I think nobody believed me because it'd be my left hand side at the front and then my right hand side at the back, it would move around, but it was excruciating. And um, eventually I saw the neurologist. I had an evoke potential test. They tested my eyesight. They tested my hearing, um, putting electrodes on, on your head. Um, I had so many different blood tests. I think I had 28 different blood tests. I had an, an MRI, a lumbar puncture. And a nurse, um, I was going to have three days intravenous steroids. And I hadn't been told the diagnosis at this time. So I was shown the bed and given some forms and things. And the nurse said to me, how long have you had MS? Now I'd been told it was either MS a brain tumor, a rare tropical disease, or I'd had a mild stroke. That's what they were investigating. That was the shortlist. The shortlist, yeah. And she said, how long have you had MS? And I said, I haven't got MS. And she said, oh, no, I must have the wrong person. Oh, I'm sorry. No. But then the consultant came and said, you've got MS. And I thought, well, I already knew that. <laughs> already knew that now. Um, <clears throat> so I had the three-day steroids. Did absolutely nothing. I was getting even worse. So he sent me for another MRI. And I said to him, so what did that MRI show? Was it any worse than the first one? And he said, oh, no, it was the same. But we're going to give you another two day, uh, three days of intravenous steroids. <clears throat> this was in a two-week period. And if you know about intravenous steroids, that's a no-no. You don't do that. Yeah. Um, so I, I blew up absolutely blew up and I was red as you can see on pale my face was like a tomato my fingers my feet everything blew up and I, I was in bed at this point not getting dressed <clears throat> so I went from 10 stone just under to just over 16 stone wow. by the time I got out of bed nothing fitted I had to send my husband out to buy a rent a tent, just get me anything that is huge because nothing fitted by about six inches. <laughs> you know, I was just so big. Um, but anyhow, I, I had this second lot of intravenous steroids being told the reason was if I didn't, I stood the chance of becoming totally blind and deaf. So, you know, you've got a consultant who's telling you that. So you um you take that advice on board don't you so anyway had the second lot of intravenous steroids did absolutely nothing the first lot i did notice the second lot i noticed nothing so i was diagnosed with relapsing and remitting ms and every six months i had a relapse another bam so if you look at it as being a ladder i was here when it first happened and then I'd have a relapse and then I'd start to get better then I'd have a relapse so normal was dropping quite it progressively rapidly get worse. exactly and then in 2003 I was told that I was secondary progressive and there was nothing more that could be done for me and the hardest thing was that the neurologist had done these different tests on me and he helped me into the chair opposite his desk. And as he was telling me um, that I was primary, uh, secondary progressive, he put his hand out and said, I'm really sorry, there's nothing more we can do for you. Shook my hand, opened the door and showed me out. Done, oh, thanks. You I know, should... there was, there was no, no plan B. And I can remember saying to my husband, in the car coming home, he might as well have said, go home and die quietly, don't make a fuss, you're an embarrassment. That is how I felt. There was nothing, you know, nothing at all. Linda, how and old were you at this time? I was 44. Yeah, it's not 44. Well, 
I didn't think so. <laughs> when I felt the, the, the end was nigh, that is how, you know, I felt. And I would, as I say, I was sleeping all the time and I was in a lot of pain. And my husband carried on working and my next door neighbour was retired and he used to come in and see that I was okay because I didn't really do much apart from sleep. And I, I'd got uh, all these pains in my head one day and uh, I said I wasn't going to cry. So I'd run out of painkillers. Now I could have really, really strong painkillers, which took the edge off the pain, which made the pain bearable. Okay, because it... I only ever took them when I couldn't stand the pain anymore, but it was a trade-off. I then got nausea if I took the pills. The nausea felt like being pregnant, being car sick, feeling absolutely <laughs> awful. And I felt as though any minute I was going to vomit if I moved my head. So I used to have to take the pills and not move at all. If not, I felt so sick. So you have to decide, did you want the excruciating pain or did you want this really bad nausea so this day the doctor came he knocked on i mean they, they don't come out these days but he knocked on the door he came came out and saw me and gave me the pills fetched me a glass of water and i said to him so when do you think i'll start to feel better i was at that low ebb um, and what was really killing me was the look in everybody's eyes you know friends stopped coming because they didn't know what to do they didn't know what to say my family my mum and dad and my mum survived um her heart attack they were always upset if we could take it from you we've had our lives we're older mm. you know we we would willingly have it And uh, <laughs> my, my family couldn't function because I would have to be the center of attention. I didn't want to be. But I had to have help to do everything. I should have got a tissue, shouldn't I? So. Um, okay. So. I've got these painkillers. So if I took them all and ended it, it was my gift to my family that they could get on with their life. Obviously, they were going to be upset. But I couldn't see any other way out of it. You know, I didn't want to die, but I was just lying in bed. And it was like watching one of those calendars, the first, the second, the third. And I did nothing. I hadn't contributed to anything. So luckily I thought who was going to find me and it was going to be my 15 year old daughter. Now you couldn't do that to a child. So I would got to find something myself that was going to help me to live again, to get my life back, to be able to participate in things. And I had very bad vertigo. So I was either on the toilet, on the floor, or asleep. And going back to 2003, the internet wasn't what it is today. It wasn't as easy to find information. And I could only concentrate for 10 minutes. That was it. I couldn't do any more than that. So I was trying to find people, because I knew I wasn't unique. There were other people that had been where I was and you know I wanted to know what they had done sorry so 
trying to find people with MS, what did they do? What, what was there out there that the doctor wasn't telling me about? And I found people in America who were taking LDN for MS and everybody said the same. If it doesn't do you any good, it's not going to do you any harm. Did I care if it was going to do me any harm? <laughs> you know, drink a pint of meth and stand on your head and repeat, you know, yeah. the, the national anthem, you know, you, you would, I would have given it a try, but it was harmless. So the next step was to try and find how I could obtain. Get the treatment. It's really hard to get hold of if you don't know how to. Exactly. Method. So I had all this information and I managed to find a doctor who sadly has passed away the last month, probably Dr. Bob Lawrence in Wales. Now he was one of the first people in the UK to prescribe LDN and um, he had a long waiting list and he listened to my story and he said, okay, take all the information to your doctor. If your doctor will prescribe it, great. If, he doesn't come back to me and I'll prescribe it. Now in the in-between time, my doctor had retired and I had a new lady doctor who looked about the same age as my eldest daughter at the time. She was very young. She didn't, she wasn't a partner in the practice. She was an employee doctor. So she didn't get a vote. Um, she told me to leave everything with her and to come back in two weeks and she said she'd read everything and she'd taken it to the partners and they had voted not to allow her to prescribe it she said but if it was me i'd want to try it so if you can find somebody to prescribe it for you i'll monitor you so i thought that was quite a good deal even though it was a negative there was a positive to come out of it so I got back to Dr. Lawrence and said, yes, I would like to try it, please, if you can prescribe it for me and my doctor will monitor me. Now, at that time of starting LDN, living in my head was like a television set that wasn't tuned in. I couldn't see properly. I couldn't think properly. I couldn't hear properly. And, and nothing made sense to me. And I would call... I don't drink tea and I'd ask my husband to make me a cup of tea and he'd say don't you mean coffee and I would say well didn't I say coffee I thought I had said coffee you know and I'd call a cat a dog or all peculiar things but to me it all sounded right and annoyingly my husband would keep correcting me because he thought that next time I would remember. And I said, it, it doesn't work like that. You're just depressing me because I'm trying hard and I can't obviously do it. It's not what I think is coming out of my head. Three weeks, um, and my eldest daughter got married um, before I started LDM. And I wasn't the person uh, I would like to have been, should we say. I really wasn't well. And three weeks later of being on LDN, it was as if somebody had tuned that television set in. I could process things. I could get things right. I could see, hear. I mean, my hearing came back slowly, slowly. It's not 100%, but it's, I can hear. You know, it's, it's okay but three weeks and that was quite amazing. Um, when you have been in a wheelchair for a while, especially being in bed and then being in a wheelchair, um, I wasn't given any physiotherapy or any help with exercises and anything. And when I tried to start to walk again, I didn't realize what was happening. <clears throat> Obviously my muscles were very weak but I was getting pains in my feet and I couldn't understand why, you know, in the arch of my foot, it was killing me. Sorry. <clears throat> and I, I went to see a podiatrist and he got me to, to stand and he rubbed his, uh, show you his thumbs up the back of my uh, legs from the ankle upwards. And he said, does it hurt here? And pressed. And it was just like, Oh yes, that hurts. And apparently all my tendons shrunk. 
yeah. and that was what was causing the pain so that was all lots of stretching exercises and so on so that was quite amazing so it took me about 18 months because things have to improve whoops i've not something improve slowly you there isn't a miracle bullet for anything is there so i was improving and i then began to feel i had my life back i was able to achieve things so in the following february now this was only the december i started ldn in the february i had to make a conscious decision what did i want to do did i want to say i'm okay i can carry on with my life or did i want to help those people that were in that deep dark place that i was in and it was a no-brainer i wanted to help everybody sing it from the rooftops you know ldn isn't a miracle drug it is a drug and it's not a cure and it doesn't work for everyone but for those people that it does work for and it's the majority of people have very good results i mean some people as you were saying earlier everybody's individual everybody's case is individual everybody's response to anything is individual but it is something that is cheap and it's worth you know uh, trying it's we did a survey um in about 2010 probably or four i can't no not four wouldn't be four but we had 400 people take part and that was quite a big deal getting 400 people who were taking ldn at that time um five percent of people would have side effects which lasted a couple of weeks or so and it would be headaches worsening of pre-existing symptoms sleep disturbance or vivid dreams that were the, the main things and at that time, LDN was meant to block your opioid receptors. So when your body made endorphins, those receptors were blocked and it looked as though your body had no endorphins. So your body would make 100% of the endorphins, but you would already have endorphins. Now, endorphins are your body's own natural feel-good factor and painkiller. So that in itself you know, was a big deal. And it wasn't until I think 2010, Dr. Gerard Younger had done a study on LDN for fibromyalgia. I've got, got a hair in my face. Um, and he discovered that LDN also worked on the toll-like receptors, which is your body's own defense mechanism to fight inflammation. So people with autoimmune diseases, cancers, have usually very high levels of inflammation and as you will know in your work by bringing down the inflammation itself regardless of whatever else you do your symptoms can decrease you can feel you know so much better now interestingly as we were talking before ldn isn't a standalone treatment you know it's not a magic bullet if you take LDN for any autoimmune disease, and there's over 440 that we know have been used to treat, or LDN has been used to treat these conditions. If you're going to sit and be a couch potato, eat junk food, you know, and sleep on and off during the day so you don't sleep at night, you're not going to be healthy. You know, you have to work at it. You need a good diet. You need exercise, you need supplementation, especially vitamin D. Um, everybody, it would seem, um, vitamin D levels are on the low side. So that is always worth it. And to find somebody who can do these tests and find out what you're deficient in. Everybody is individual. So you, taking a multivitamin is better than taking nothing. <laughs> but you might need other supplementation along with it. Um, for example, a lot of doctors recommend probiotics to take for your gut. Um, gut health is a, a really big deal that we don't seem to recognize so much in this country as they do in America. Um, 
so the LDN Research Trust was born in 2004. And at that time, we were working to try and get doctors to do further clinical trials and, and studies. But that didn't really work out because there weren't enough LDN prescribers, researchers, people that were interested in it. So it was like, OK, let's take a step back. Let's get more people prescribing it. Let's get more people trying LDN so that these doctors can see the results, which has worked really well. If you go on PubMed, you will see that every month there are some trials or studies that have been done for LDN for different conditions, which is really, really good. And I can show you, ah, you've disabled uh, screen sharing. I need to let you share the screen, don't I? You do. Go for it. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Now I've got to actually find it again. Let me. Yeah. Uh... So for people that are listening, you can you can see this information on the video, obviously, um, but also you can go to um, the website and and it will all be there. Yeah. So this is. Can you see it? The screen or not? not? Okay. Okay, what have I done wrong? Can you see it now? Hmm? Oh, I see. There we go. Oh, I've got to click share. Okay, so this is our new super duper website that we, we've had built uh, this year, in fact. Don't know where the year's gone. So uh, this is the home page, and you can find a prescriber wherever you are. Um, the pharmacist, our user guides, which are fantastic, we have them in different languages, different countries. Uh, the difference between the US and the UK is we use A4, they use letter size, and different drugs are slightly different. So we've got dosing guides, patient guides, and prescriber guides. So if you're interested in LDN for any condition that LDN could help for, um, and you want to take the information to your prescriber, it's here. Their information for yourself is here and the dosing protocol is there. Now, all the LDN conditions can be found here on this page. Um, it says at the top here, look, LDN conditions, chronic pain, um, all the different headings, neurological, and as you can see, the neurological diseases that LDN can help are all of these. There's an awful lot of them, and MS being there. So, so there's, that's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a huge list of yes conditions that yep. uh, low dose naltrexone can help yeah and um, especially uh, thyroid ones um yeah so that information is there and also um we've got here what is ldn how naltrexone works so you can listen to the experts and a study that's been done to show it's um safe what types of ldn now, this warning is from the MHRA, which is the medicines regulatory body. And it was a press release that they did a big warning not to buy drugs online. Most of them are counterfeit and a lot of them are actually harmful. Absolutely. So, you know, LDN uh, being now Trexone is a drug and as such, it has to be prescribed by a prescriber. If you buy it online, you're not knowing what you're buying. Um, it could be absolutely anything. And that means it's bypassed any safety checks, efficacy. It's, you wouldn't want to play Russian roulette with your life. You know, life the, is too valuable. The great thing about the site is that when people are looking, you know, the people that are looking for this kind of thing are in a really bad place a lot of the yeah. time any any of the conditions that are listed on the on the site are quite debilitating and when we get to a place where we're really not you know we're looking at the end of the road shall we say people will do quite desperate things mm -hmm. so what the the great thing about uh, the site is that it gives you all of the tools you need to get it legitimately yes. you don't need to go and buy it on the black market or yeah. Uh, some dodgy website on online you can actually 
get all the information that you need, take it to your GP or find a GP who's sympathetic to the cause mm -hmm. and get a prescription for it. So there's no need for anybody to, to go and do anything that they shouldn't do because it's, you've done all the work that's needed, right? That's right. And here um, there are hundreds of trials and studies and you can put in a condition. Let's just stick with MS. Uh, a bit further. Multiple sclerosis. And these are the studies that mention multiple sclerosis. As you can see, there's a fair few there. <laughs> yeah. And there's another page. So uh, how many pages? I'm not sure. Oh, there's two, two pages. Um, so that is nice for those people that want to wade through uh, clinical trial papers. And then, again, we've got pharmacists, prescribers, and even vets, and who do telemed consultations. I mean, that's a big thing these days is um, online finding... Consults. And online consults are really, I mean, all of my work's online, but on, online consults with um, prescribing doctors are very useful because it's not, you know, we're in a new kind of era nowadays where historically we have to go to our local GP. We have to live within their area and we have to register at their surgery. Nowadays, we can speak to any doctor anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so long as they're happy with the condition, they will prescribe what's needed and we can then f fill that prescription at our local chemist. So if, I mean, one of the questions I had was, why are more people not aware of low dose naltrexone and why is it not spoken about more okay well let's let's just say for example somebody does have a, a telemed consultation now there are thousands of doctors in the uk that will prescribe ldn on the nhs now, if the prescription is sent to Dixon's Pharmacy in Scotland, it's not unless the prices have gone up. Uh, it used to be £30 a month for the LDN. But if your doctor prescribed LDN in your hometown and they take it to their local chemist, the local chemist would have to have it compounded by a specials lab. And sometimes, and then they put their markup on it, it could be eighty pound, uh, 800 pounds mm. for one month's supply. And then the doctors say it's too expensive. We're not going to prescribe it. So there are lots of people that have had that issue, but if they send it off to Dixon's in, in Scotland, it's 30 pounds and out of a budget, the doctors don't mind 30 pounds because mm. drugs are quite expensive. Uh, but if you get a private prescription, it still costs you £30 a month out of pocket. Now, I'm not a smoker, but I'm told if you were a smoker, it would cost you easily £30 maybe a week to smoke as opposed to £30 a month for, I think, for LDN. I, I think you'll find, I, I don't know what they are now, but a pack of cigarettes is something like £10 at least or something. Something and, silly, I think. So that's like £300 a month. If you're no. working a pack a day, I guess. So £30 is nothing really in the scheme of things, no. especially for people who are sick. They'll spend more than that yes. on aloe vera juice or whatever it is, to yeah. you know, because I think that that's the, the, the one thing that they need. Yes. Um, so the fact that it is available and it's, you know, it's one of these drugs that, unlike a, a, a potential cancer drug or something like that, which costs tens of thousands and you have to go to the U S or to Poland to get it or whatever it is, mm. you know, this is actually an affordable thing that's available yes. via the NHS. Well, now Trexone has been out since the 1970s yeah. and it was trialed and found to be only harmful to the liver in doses of 300 milligrams a day. Now LDN standing for low dose now Trexone is usually in the range of three milligrams to 4.5 so it's a very minuscule dose. It, it doesn't do you any harm. And there've been lots of trials and studies, as I've said, that have proved that. And it only stays in your body for four hours. So every day you get a 20 hour break. So it's not addictive. 
and people can just stop taking it. Um, there are people who have said, and it's very easy when you are sick, I'll stop this screen sharing, um, to notice, you know, okay, now I've got vertigo, now I have got swallowing problems, now I've got this problem, that problem. But when it works the other way, when you can start swallowing again, do you think to yourself, I can swallow again? You forget that you couldn't mm. swallow. You forget that you probably used to wake up six times in the night and now you're sleeping through the night. It's funny how the mind works that when you improve, you can't remember. So some people will say after six months, it's not done anything for me. You know, I'm going to stop taking it. I can't afford to spend 30 pounds a month. But we have seen that LDN can sometimes stabilize a condition. And then after 18 months, you'll get symptom relief. I don't know how or why, but we would say if you can afford it, take it for 18 months and then, you know, see. But the number of people that will stop and after two or three weeks, obviously only works while you're taking it. So then gradually all these symptoms that you'd forgotten you had start to come back and people say, whoa, I didn't realize it actually was working for me. Yeah. And they, they take it again. It's, a, it, it's, it's, an, it's not an uncommon story when people start feeling better and then they go, well, none of this has worked. I just, I feel normal. Yes. We say, yeah, but you weren't feeling normal four months ago. You were feeling really sick. Look, we've got the questionnaire and your details. You told us this was happening, that was happening. Oh, yeah, yeah. But, you know, I just don't think it's worked. Mm. And you're right. If they stop doing something, it, it, take it to the other extreme. Let's not talk about naltrexone. But if you talk about just habits and people tidy their diet up even, and they start feeling better, their bloating goes, or they sleep better, they've got more energy, whatever else it is. And then think, oh, I'm all right now. And then they go back to eating the way they used to eat. Mm -hmm. And all the problems come back again. And they go, oh, I told you that diet didn't work. You go, well, hang on a minute. While you were doing it, you felt great. You lost five pounds in three weeks. You haven't lost weight in the last five years. You felt great. Everything was good. Your, your sleep was better, your energy, everything else. And then you stopped doing the diet and then it all went wrong again. So it wasn't actually when you were doing it that was wrong. It's when you stopped and went back to what you were doing and they go, Oh yeah, yeah, I suppose so. And I'm not saying diet is the cure for everything. I mean, it's a no. big part of it, yes. but it's the illustration that people will think they just need to do something short term, get the relief they want and think they're fixed. Yes. And unfortunately, nothing's further from the truth. You need to fix a lot of other things underlying to get long-term uh, benefits out of it. But now Trexone as a drug, as you say, it's dose dependent. So you need to keep taking it to keep getting the, um, the results from it. Yeah. Um, so, and a lot of people will look at that and go much like statins. Okay, statins don't improve your cholesterol or the underlying problem. They just stop cholesterol being produced. And statins, if, you, if someone takes them, has a higher all cause mortality rate so the death of anything comes to people who take statins more than if you didn't take them regardless of cardiovascular risk and so people look at it and go well the statins aren't actually doing anything you need to deal with the underlying problem the issue here with naltrexone is the things that it's dealing with they aren't really any other things that can be done for them so things like ms there is still no known root cause cure fix as it were mm. so getting somebody to be more functional allowing them to be able to actually live again and hold a conversation and you know have control over their bowel and all the rest of it that's a huge 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 benefit and if you have to keep taking it because that's the only way that you can have that better quality of life again then in this particular case I think it's a really, really underrated, underused prescription that, that could cause a huge amount of benefit for so many people. Mm -hmm. I mean, success stories. <clears throat> I mean, Crohn's disease. I've had some amazing stories. Cancers, where tumours have 
vanished, you know, and then they're wondering, was it a misdiagnosis? But when you can actually see a tumour on a scan, you can't. And the same with uh, Crohn's disease when you've had, you know, um, the camera inside and they've taken all the pictures, there's, there's proof, there's evidence. I mean, people with um, chronic fatigue syndrome who couldn't move off the sofa, couldn't look after their children, mm. to going back to work, a full-time job and looking after the children. You know, really, really amazing stories. And chronic pain, where people had pain at a score of nine to 10, either, I mean, in some cases, went to zero, but there are people who still have the pain, you know, a two to three or a three to four, where they could feel the pain, but it didn't stop them from leading an ordinary life. They were still able to function. And they said they could feel the pain, but it didn't bother them. They didn't need to take anything. But, but also they weren't taking high dose painkillers that were making them feel sick and not being able to do anything other than lay in bed. But interestingly, when you go back to the cancer, you'd, you'd use it as a, as a part of a treatment? Yes, part of the protocol. Okay, so so people were still be doing their chemo, radiotherapy, whatever else it is. <clears throat> You'd add that as a as a uh, a potential um, extra. Adjunct, yeah. And but then afterwards, you wouldn't need to continue taking it in that circumstance. Well, people usually once they've gone into remission, continue to take LDN. Right <clears throat> now, um, full twenty sixteen, I believe it was. Professor Angus Delgleish, who's a top oncologist at St. George's in London, and his team, um, Dr. Wei Lu included, did a paper. Uh, they, they did it in a, a laboratory where they found that LDN treating cancer cells, that there is a documentary on our website. If you look at those tabs at the top, far right, it will say events and it's got LDN conferences and there is uh, interviews and you'll be able to see the interview and a documentary we did <clears throat> on cancer and the paper that they, they did. But it, it showed that cancer cells that were in remission by using pulse dosing caused cell death. And this was a paper that they'd had published that showed that low dose naltrexone could kill cancer cells. So that was a really big whopping whoa but i don't know but so, so would, it be, the, would it be the naltrexone that's doing it or would it be the fact that it's reducing the inflammatory response and that allows then the body's immune to deal better with the tumor it's not it's not is it, it the naltrexone that's actually working directly on the tumor or is it just they they were saying so that okay. it was interesting it was the uh, naltrexone that caused the, the cell death but there are, have been lots of, I mean, lots of really new, interesting data in the last, how many years I've been doing this, 16 and a half years. And the other big thing, and we've got a pain documentary as well that we made, where people who are addicted to opioids, I'm not talking heroin addicts on the street here, I'm talking drug addicts on prescription yeah. medications through no fault of their <coughs> own, um, just by being prescribed the um, opioids. That they have pain specialists in, a, in America are using ultra dose naltrexone in micro doses. So as I say, when I first started, it was three milligrams you start on, people now start on 0.5 or 1.5. The microdosing is 0 0.001. It is so minuscule, really, really minuscule. But by taking such a low dose alongside of the opioids, you, you don't alter anything at this stage. Yeah. It makes the opioid more effective. So where uh, people who take opioids will know that when you're on a dose of opioids, your body gets it, tolerates it and it stops working. The only thing you can do is to either add another opioid or increase that yeah. opioid. So that's how you get addicted because you have to keep increasing it, increasing it, increasing it to get the same benefits. So you, you get to a point where it's not working anymore, but you can't stop taking it. 
but you're, you're still in pain. So these microdoses make the opioids work more effectively. So that means you can then start to taper the opioids down, but at the same time, titrating the microdosing up. So it's a seesaw. Yeah. So you're slowly doing one up, one down, and they're actually weaning people off the opioids. You know, people that have been addicted for like 20 years. It's, it's really amazing. And they do it. And I've met many in person of these people who've told me their stories. They haven't gone through withdrawal. Mm. There is no withdrawal doing it that way. And these are ideas. We are talking very highly esteemed pain specialists who are well respected in their field. Wouldn't it be great for all those people that are now unable to get those medications that are buying illegal drugs because they're, they can't stop taking them to help them come off all of these medications? I, I think there'll be some big drug companies that are not going to be very happy about the fact that you're able to take people off of their long term drug use and therefore a renewable but I think it, for them. But I think it's the it's a phenomenal um, problem, especially in the States. There's a huge amount of prescription opioids being, uh, being given out every year. And the problem is becoming more and more, um, becoming worse. So if, if there's a way of getting people to reverse that with mm -hmm. microdosing, uh, and then, you know, like you say, titrate up the LDN and titrate down the opioid, um, I just don't know why all the doctors are not just doing it. But the problem they've got in America is a, a lot of doctors are not allowed to prescribe the opioids anymore. Mm. You know, and, and that is just how cheated you'd feel for somebody who has been in chronic pain and you've followed your doctor's advice and you're completely hooked on these opioids to suddenly be told we can't give them to you. Yeah. So they you know, go straight to the internet, buy whatever they can get off of there or whatever else it is, and it just becomes... Scary. But not only that, I mean, when you're taking high doses of opioid um, medication, look what it does to all your organs. Mm. You know, it, it's not the answer, is it? No. Well, so hopefully no. all of that is going to change anyway. No, is, yeah. So, okay. So what if somebody hasn't got any issues? Mm -hmm. and they're living a perfectly healthy life um they feel fine um they might have a little niggle here or there or just what you would call a normal kind of person mm -hmm. is there a value in low dose naltrexone to to the general public you know, because a lot of people the, suffer from inflammation right so a yeah. lot of people mm -hmm. suffer inflammatory issues mm -hmm. um, and and i'm all about get to the root cause of it let's get that sorted out because then we've got long-term benefits. Mm -hmm. But when we look at the other side of the coin where people are trying to, um, what's called biohack, and it's a term that I'm not particularly fond of, but they're trying to find you know, what's the thing that's going to make me live longer or yes. you know, how am I going to improve my health and so on. Is there a, is there a place for naltrexone there? There is actually, and I interviewed a doctor in America, a doctor, Syed, Salzala, and he has started a platform and he's doing telemed consultations for longevity um, for healthy people who want to live longer live healthier um, anti-aging if you like and I don't like that word either really uh, <clears throat> so he's putting together um, different things that people can do to help hopefully live a healthy life longer and to put all the conditions that you could potentially get as you get older at bay where you wouldn't get them as early as you would to push, to push the boundaries yeah, yeah. back as, as far as you can. So uh, he's doing that. That's a, a new um, program that he started. It's, it's on our website. And I can't for the life of me remember it, what it's called now. Um, 
But anyway, he's doing it and there are lots of other doctors that are doing it. There are many doctors that are taking it themselves and they haven't got any issues. Um, telemed consultations in the UK, um, we are regulated differently than they are in the US. And to get a prescription of LDN, you need to um, send a letter that is proof of your diagnosis. Yeah. So uh, if you haven't got a diagnosis of something, um, that would be problematic. Um, but, but, there are, there are, but there are reasons and, and, and benefits potentially for, for healthy people to add something like that to their you know their regular regime of trying to keep themselves as well as they can and, and maybe get a bit of a longevity uh benefit out of it so that's interesting I'm, i would assume it's quite a small dose and you would yes take, um that's right that way but it, 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 it's interesting that you know it can it can help everyone and not just people who who are at the very other end of the spectrum like you were who are you know basically non-functional can't keep control of their bodily functions and, and and can't think straight it's you know from that perspective turning that around is pretty miraculous it was ageless rx was the right. longevity um website where he's um prescribing ldn for healthy people but uh yeah it's okay, not so something we particularly promote um in the uk because i you would have to find an ldm prescriber who would be willing to prescribe it for you yeah. when it's no specific condition well, it's, it's an, interesting, an interesting concept and 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 um, probably worth people being aware of I, mean, I know a lot of people do have uh, consults with doctors in america and they can get um prescribed from there and that kind of stuff so it's interesting just to know that it's available and no doubt in a few years time it will be over here you know we tend to be a couple of years behind what goes on there um in the good and bad mm -hmm. you know they all start eating burgers and chips and we start eating it a few years yeah. later and <laughs> that kind of thing um okay so if people want to find out more about you and the work and and get all the details of those um studies and know how to ask their doctor and so on what is the address of the website yes it's www ldnresearchtrust.org and they can email me which is a shorter version linda l-i-n-d-a at ldnrt.org and and i'll put all that in the show notes where other people will be able to click straight on it and, and go into it but um fascinating stuff and um when you talk about anti-aging you know i'm mid 50s you're 10 years older <laughs> you look better than I do, which is a little bit upsetting. But <laughs> the fact that you've been through all of that stuff, normally when people go through such a chronic long-term uh, illness that's so destructive, they generally look pretty poor. Even mm -hmm. later on in life, they look like they've had a really hard life. Um, so you're kind of a testament to say that there could be something in the, the whole anti-aging kind of aspect of it as well. Well, it's funny, a lot of people that have taken LDN for many years don't look their age. Right, get me a bucket you know? load. So I don't, I don't know. I mean, my youngest daughter, who uh, she was pregnant at 21 and people thought she was 15. She looked very, very young and she got some really snide comments because people thought she was still at school. Right. Uh, I mean, 21 isn't old but it's not as young as 15 but my mum had very good skin she didn't really ah, look her age it's a genetic thing so i don't not i don't know but, but my daughter said she was paying me a backhanded compliment saying something like um well i probably when i get older won't look my age either you know and yeah. i thought that was as I say, a backhanded compliment that she didn't think I, I looked right. Either, either way, it's great that you're fit, well, healthy, functioning, getting the message out, doing so much good work. So we appreciate you for all of that. I mean, it's, it really is something that's so important to people who can be very desperate. And, um, you know, if there's, there's, there's help available, then that's great. 
Um, I'm sure we could talk for hours, um, but um, we're going to get the uh, the website up and everything else on the on the show notes so people can click onto it. Um, they've got the email address for them to contact you. Anything else that you think is useful for them to be aware of? Well, yes. And I'll go back to the screen sharing. We had the LDN book, um, the first LDN book launched in um, 2016. And here's all the information on the book. And we've got the second book, which is the yellow and orangey one there. Um, people can buy it at discounted prices. Uh, we've got it launched in Chicago, which is going to be an online Skype, uh, Zoom, and it's $10, which I think is about £8 if you want to take part. And you'll be able to submit your questions. Um, there is myself, there is Dr. Sarah Zeldorf, who is one of our medical advisors, very, very knowledgeable lady on LDN. And she also does functional medicine and a pharmacist. So any questions there um, you want to, to take part. We've got another one on the 15th of October, 17th, uh, 21st, 24th, 28th and 29th. Um, they, they're all different. Uh, this one here on in Canada on the 28th that is um, a free registration. So uh, you can take part, ask your questions there and it's totally free. So these books are really good. Um, they are used by medical professionals as their Bibles. They're all written by doctors. Every chapter is by a different condition. Um, and when you are somebody who is ill, I find those are the people that become their own researchers, want to do their own homework, find out you know, what it is I've got, how it works, how the body works, how I can treat it, all the different other things you can do as, as long as, alongside of LDN. <coughs> and of course, mm. so, your questions are important. So do, do, do you, do you um, would, would you just buy the, the second volume? Is it an updated version or? No, it's volume two. Okay, so, so that so, they it's part of a series there will be a volume three i mean the first one did cover ms and lupus um crohn's disease ulcerative colitis the first chapter is the history and pharmacology of, of ldn so you can actually learn everything you need to do it's, it's very comprehensive the second book has got the same first chapter but it's been updated with the the latest information and the second book, um, as I say, it's all um, different. It deals with chronic pain. So we talked briefly about using ultra low dose, gut health, dermatological conditions, Parkinson's disease, treating children with LDN, it's a pediatric um, chapter, and women's health. Now, that is a, a big, big deal when you've got polycystic ovaries, endometriosis, um, painful periods, heavy periods, all of that kind of thing is discussed in there. And it's amazing what LDN can do for that. And traumatic brain injury, um, that's a, a really big one. And then we have two mental health chapters, disassociative disorders. And Dr. Wittger Papp, she's from Germany, and she wrote a paper. She does amazing work with people in her psychiatric hospital, uh, as do Dr. Galen Forrester and Ulrich Lanus. Ulrich is from Canada and Galen is from, um, um, from America. And that's post-traumatic stress disorder, which covers far greater than I thought. I thought originally it was just veterans, you know, post-war um, PSD, PS. TD, um, but of course it's rape victims, it's children that have been bullied. I mean, the range of the yeah. scope is amazing. And we've and also, got- We find there's a lot of um, uh, post-traumatic stress disorders uh, on people that lose children, yes. um, you know, have bereavements in their family and 
uh, and so on. It's, it's, it's a much, much more prevalent issue than, than people think. It's not exactly. just for people that come back from a war, which exactly. obviously is a very um, mm. sharp end of the stick, but it's, it's definitely... Have, have you had much... Because um, you've got so much detail on the site, I haven't trawled through it all, but is there much on Lyme disease? Yes, there is. And Lyme disease is chapter 11 in the book yeah. uh, and tick-borne illnesses. And we also did a fantastic... Uh, Lyme disease documentary. We we went to America. We interviewed the top people there that are using LDN. And as you know, it's multifaceted. Um, Lyme disease. Yeah. It is more complex than multiple sclerosis, and that's bad enough. Um, but it has to be used as part of the protocol. You know, it's another tool in in the box. It's not the only tool in the box. Um, and then we've got the dosing protocol again in the um, book. So they are all, all the information that's in book two, apart from the, um, the first chapter is completely different than the first book in book yeah. two. Well, so I'm that gonna, is good. I'm gonna order both of those when we finish. Well, get them you going to be you can uh, get some discounts <laughs> if yeah, you look uh, we don't sell them ourselves because it would be an absolute nightmare because we have members all over the world and yeah. shipping costs i mean that they're cheaper you know getting it from amazon or somewhere yeah no no brilliant okay so look, our, there's so much more that the the site offers people and i think everyone who's interested should just get to the site have a trawl through it I don't think that site is the kind of place you can go and just look at all in one go. I think you need to revisit it a few times because there's so much stuff there. Um, but, you know, like I said, keep doing what you're doing. It's much appreciated by a lot of people. And if we can get the message out more to more people that are not aware of this treatment, then um, great. You know, it's going to help more people. Well, we've got over a hundred conference past conference presentations online so people can watch those find their own condition and, uh, fantastic watch. well listen i'm i'm mindful of of your time um we've been on quite a while today so thank you for spending the time with me it's lovely to speak to somebody in the uk for a change normally it's abroad so our timing was a lot easier um but i do have to apologize to people who are listening or watching that there is some sort of drilling going on nearby and and i'm no doubt you can hear it uh, picked up by the microphone so uh, i appreciate the fact that you've stayed on this long if you have and um and listen to the whole show because i think it's quite important but um i think it'd be really good to get you back on and talk about some specific uh conditions and treatments um in the future because i think a lot of people are you know looking for specifics and if we can just give them a little bit more information on them. I think that'd be really useful. But um, until then, um, again, I really appreciate your time and um, I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Okay, thank you. Take care, bye.